All right. Hello, cocktail lovers and appreciators. Thank you guys for joining us for our virtual mixer. Uh, we've got about an hour together, so I want to get right to it as our mixologist has so much amazingness to take you through. Before we jump into that, I'd love to introduce everyone to John Kilduff, who is here with us from Keurig Dr. Pepper. Um, I know some of you on this call today received a mixer kit prior to today, and some of you did not. Both are perfect. John is going to explain to you some of the products that our mixologist is going to use, and then we'll get started mixing. So, John, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thanks, Jillian. Hi, everyone. So my name is John Kildoff. I am a national account executive with uh, Keurig Dr. Pepper. I'd like to spend a few minutes with you to discuss our bar mixer program at Buyer's Edge. If you are not taking advantage of our Buyer's Edge bar mixer program, let me share with you some of the benefits of the program. The first benefit is that we have guaranteed pricing into distribution on all items available on the program. The second benefit is that there are rebates available on all items purchased. And the third benefit is we have marketing dollars to help you drive sales and increase your profits. If you have any questions regarding our program with Buyer's Edge, please reach out to your manufacturer or growth specialist. So the slide you see in front of you gives you a high level overview of the brands and items that are part of our program with Buyer's Edge. Now, please keep in mind, this is just a high level snap stop, but does it show all the flavors and pack sizes that are available to you? So let's start, let's start on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see our Mr. and Mrs. T's. Now, we have done a lot of innovating and renovating with this brand over the last few years. Our Mr. and Mrs. T's are made from premium quality ingredients. We have refreshed our graphics and started to move to cleaner ingredients, which we know consumers are looking for. We have also converted all of our Mr. and Mrs. T's to 100% cane sugar. And some of our products, we use sea salt. So the brand in the middle, so the right of Mr. and Mrs. T's is Roses. Roses is the number one on-premise mixer brand. It is a brand bartenders like and trust. It's known for its quality and consistency, delivering great tasting beverages each and every time. We have Roses Grenadine available, sweet lime juice, sweet and sour, and simple syrup, which we introduced last year. The brand to the right of Roses is Clamato. Clamato is a tomato cocktail with a splash of clam juice. It is the number one tomato cocktail brand used as a mixer. It is used to make the Michelada as well as the Bloody Caesar, which is very popular in the Northeast and in Canada. All of these brands are available through your broadline distributor partner, whether it's a national distributor or a local or regional distributor. We also have a partnership with Dot Foods. So if there is a brand that you would like um, and your distributor does not stock it, they can always get it through Dot. Jan, you can move to this, uh, the next page. Here's our bar mixer sample kit that many of you received. If you, if you did not receive a kit and you like one, please reach out to your contact person, person at Bar's Edge and we'll make sure to have one shipped to you. So what's inside the kit? So the cons kit consists of six of our most popular flavors. Our Mr. and Mrs. T original Bloody Mary mix, our Mr. and Mrs. T margarita mix and sweet and sour mix, our Roses Grenadine, sweet lime juice, and simple syrup. We have also included a flash drive uh, in the kit. On this flash drive, you will find brand and product information as well as drink recipes. Uh, also included is our food service trifold brochure. So you can see it's on the bottom left-hand corner. This shows you or provides you all the brands that are available on our program of Buyer's Edge. Uh, next slide, Jen. So if you guys have any questions, uh, here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me, whether it's questions regarding our brand, samples. Here I listed my uh, cell phone number as well as my office number and my email address. So if there's not any questions, I'll just give it back to you, Jillian. 
Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, John. And I'm sure by the end of this, once you see what our mixologist is doing, you guys are going to be itching for those. So the link is in the chat. That's there for you to contact us for any more information. But now let's get over to Devin from Hollow Leg, based out of Chicago, Illinois, to mix things up for us. Guys, it's so good to see some of your shining faces, which will be ever shinier once I'm done with you, because of course you'll be drinking today. And if you're not drinking today, I will make sure that you've got all of the recipes. They'll be not only in the chat down below, but they'll also be given to the entire team to circulate. So if you've got those mixers, you can use those later tonight, or of course, tomorrow morning for your 8.30 Zoom. Got to get you through the day somehow, y'all. Here's the first thing that I want to remind you of. When we're talking about any type of mixology, a lot of people think that it's just a recipe class that we've got to go onto Google. We've got to find things, but that's not my background at all. I actually won a national cocktail competition back in 2014 as a complete amateur. That's right, guys. I had no experience in bartending or mixology. The closest I had ever been to making a cocktail in any fashion whatsoever, guys, was my first job out of high school at a very pretentious and high end cocktail bar. I'm sure you've all heard of it because it's nationally known. It's called Ruby Tuesday. Do you guys remember that one? The Ruby Tuesday? Yes. Does it sound fancier when I say it like that? It was a Ruby Tuesdays. Okay, guys, salad bar and all. But when I entered a national cocktail competition back in 2014, I had two things going for me. I had a background in science and that's why my interest for chemistry and food came from. And of course, guys, I also had a background in sustainable agriculture. I was really interested in seeing the whys and the hows of mixers and alcohol and temperature and dilution coming together to create incredible things. So when I won that national cocktail, cocktail competition, I decided to take mixology classes in a whole new direction. And instead of doing something like, oh, I'm just going to stand back here with my ironic facial hair and make y'all follow recipe, I thought, let's make this with some Julia Child-like conviction. Let's teach the whys and the hows, the science behind these cocktails. And that's why when I started mixing with these, I was really excited. And the first one I'm going to start you guys with is a take on a Bloody Mary. But it's not quite what you think. It's actually simpler and it thinks it's got a little bit more interesting note. So usually, guys, when we're thinking about things like Bloody Marys or cocktails in general, the first thing we need to remind ourselves that the most important ingredient is usually not the mixers or even the alcohol. It's the ice. That's right, y'all. Water is the most important part in any type of cocktail. One third of every single cocktail is water. And there's a few reasons for this. First of all, Tim Parker, are you 23 years of age or younger, hopefully above the age of 21? Fantastic. Guys, here's the thing. We are not youngins anymore. Do you remember, Bob, when you could um, Jaeger bomb all day and then jump out of bed feeling like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh the next day? And then all of a sudden, honey, you have leave, look at a glass of wine. And next thing you know, you're in the hurt box for two days. That's because we need to dilute the alcohol down. We're not as young as we think, guys. So we got to dilute everything. And we also have to think about temperature. Temperature plays a massive part in mixology. It's what separates a Bloody Mary from a cup of soup. I'll explain in just a second. When we first make this cocktail, the thing I want you guys to remember is that we are going to build this particular cocktail, not as a shake and drink. And here's the reason. When we are looking at flavors that our mouth can pick up, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, umami flavor is really where Bloody Marys fit. As a matter of fact, Bloody Marys are considered the most complex and nuanced cocktails known to humankind. They are really interesting because umami is the Japanese word for delicious. And we loosely translate that to savory, which means things like MSG and sodium, things that are going to have more of that tomato flavor, anything that's going to be more of the um, mushrooms, anything that's going to be briny like seafood, meaty like steak, fermented like kimchi. That is really where, of course, we've got our Bloody Mary. But for this particular one, I think it's fascinating because here's what we're going to do. The first thing we want to do is we want to build our garnish. Now we're kind of going backwards on the Bloody Mary. And the reason why we want to build our garnish first is because we want something that's going to be what we call trigeminally effective. A lot of people think that when you taste something, guys, you're just tasting it with your tongue, but don't lie to mama. How many times, Rebecca, have you done a shot, girlfriend, like this? And then you gave one of those little shimmies. Ooh, you know what I'm talking about? We've all been there, guys. And what I want you to remember is that that sting of alcohol that you guys pick up on your mouth, that is not a flavor. That is a chemical sensation. That chemical sensation is picked up by your nerve endings. It's called your trigeminal nerve. And your trigeminal nerve, which starts in your brain and goes through your sinus cavity and ends up back where your wisdom teeth are, it is what picks up on chemical sensation in your mouth, like that sting of alcohol that gives you that shimmy. Of course, the 
other things that give you this trigeminal effect are things like the heat and hot peppers or cayenne pepper, right? So it's not a flavor is spiciness. It's a sensation that happens in your mouth. The cooling sensation of menthol and the pungency of garlic and ginger are other trigeminal effects that create that sort of party in your mouth where everyone's invited. And that's where this cocktail starts. So the first thing I did is I went ahead and I took a glass and I took kind of a fun glass. It's a little swerve to it. And I put some real lemon on the side. So I just made sure just like I would with anything, I threw some real lemon on it. And then I ended up putting a cayenne rim because what I want people to do is I want you to be able to decide your own fate. Do you want a little bit more heat, something more trigeminally effective as you sip this cocktail? Or if you need a little break, you'll know that this side is not rim. So we can really give you a little bit of a break on the heat. Now, when we build this, we first want to build ice into the cup. So I'm just going to take a couple of freezer ice cubes just that I pulled right out of the freezer. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stick them right in my glass. Because here's the thing, we don't want to make any type of Bloody Mary cocktail a shaking cocktail. This is going to be a stirred cocktail. And I'm sure you guys all know about James Bond, right? Shaken and stirred and why he preferred shaken versus a stirred cocktail. Well, guys, let's think of what umami really is. The chemical ways that we like to think of umami, they're very temperature dependent. So let's just think of it like this. Who here loves cold pizza versus hot pizza? If you prefer warm pizza, something hot, fresh out of the oven, you probably prefer umami flavors. That's because the flavor of umami is very temperature dependent. The warmer something is, the more umami that you can detect that sort of savory flavor to it. But the colder that drink becomes, the more you can pick up on the salt. Because of course, the temperature change will actually numb your mouth out from changing, from tasting the umami. So when we're thinking about the difference between a hot cup of soup, right? The tomato soup and a Bloody Mary, the only difference really is usually temperature. So I wanna make sure that this is going to be a cold drink, but I don't want it too cold, right? I don't want it aerated and fluffy. So this is where it brings me to my beautiful Bloody Mary mix. Now I love this stuff because it really is quite balanced. Um, on a lot of the flavors on here, you can taste a little bit of that salt, that sodium. So I really want to keep that to the forefront. I like something that's got a lot of flavor build. The tomato is a great umami base and we're adding quite a bit of this. So I'm going to go ahead and put this particular recipe in the chat for you to see. We're going to go ahead and add three full ounces of Bloody Mary mix. Now this seems like a lot and it is, and it should be three ounces is going to give us a great base right Right over the top over our ice. But of course, guys, it's not a Bloody Mary if we don't add an alcohol. And this is where I think the most exciting part of this part comes in. It's going to be mezcal. That's right. We're not adding vodka into this Bloody Mary. We're going to go with something that's going to give more leverage to the mix itself. Remember that there's no such thing as a good alcohol or a bad alcohol. It's what its use is for. And I think mezcal has been overlooked in a Bloody Mary for a long time. Remember that Bloody Marys have have that lovely sodium content in it. It's got fantastic amounts of umami, but we need to make it a little bit more complex. Okay. We're not making hashtag basic Bloody Marys up in this joint. So we need to add something that's got some sort of smokiness, some earthiness. And what better than something that's a Blanco Mezcal? This is a Joven Mezcal, so it's not been aged or in any type of barrel. But what it is, is that the piña or the heart of that agave plant has actually been roasted before they distilled it. And this means we're going to get something more earthy and we're going to get something that's a little bit more rich on the tongue. Now, because I like to do a little kickback on this, we're not going to add too much. We're only adding in one full ounce of mezcal into this drink. Because remember, we want all of the mezcal, which is a much stronger flavor, to also be balanced with the lovely strong flavors of the umami mixer. Now, of course, last but not least, whenever you're making a cocktail like this, you need to stir it. It's not good enough to just let the ice sit in here. So I'm going to take something I got from my 1950s retro parents, and um, it says spiked with devil's dew right on here to go ahead and give me a little stir. And I'm going to stir this for about 
about 20 seconds. Remember that stirring for about 20 seconds is going to dilute the cocktail enough, as well as it's going to add a little bit of that temperature change that we're looking for. So we're not getting a tomato soup type of cocktail. And then of course, once you've done, I always want everybody to smell things. So if you're not making a cocktail now, that's totally fine. But later tonight, put your nose, your nose is your strongest sense as a human being. And when you smell this, the first thing you are introduced to is the richness, of course, of the actual Bloody Mary mix. But you can also smell that undertow of smoke. It's something more going on under the surface. It's almost kind of like a bacon wash in here, guys, without any type of meat or bacon. It's just going to give you that extra je ne sais quoi, if you must, inside of this cocktail. So then I'm going to give it a taste. And by the way, I like things spicy. So I could have rimmed this whole thing all the way down to here with a cayenne pepper. And mama would have been happy with it. Hmm. And you'll notice first, when you've got that cayenne rim, you were introduced to that trigeminal spice right off the bat. It mellows on the tongue for a little bit because of course you've got a little bit of the sweetness of the tomato juice. But then guys, the trigeminal nerve in the back of your mouth picks up on all of that lovely mezcal. It's a fantastic drink. It's good for the morning. And hey, nobody can tell on Zoom if it's got alcohol or not, Jody. So you can just like bring this on into your 7 a.m. and say, hey, it's just, you know, my V8 in the morning and no one's going to know the difference. Right, girl? I mean, I'm trying to, telling you, these, these Zoom meetings start earlier and early in the a.m. We got to get through it. Guys, the second cocktail that I'm going to make, I think is really interesting. Um, I'm a big fan of Italy. I was actually I'm supposed to move there last year permanently. I think we all know how those plans turned out. Am I right? Ooh, guys, I'm obsessed with an Aperol spritz. And the thing is, is that when I've done a lot of bartending um, training and I've done a lot of consulting over my years in Rome, in England, in Tokyo, here in the United States from coast to coast, women per capita are the largest group of people buying cocktails. And yet there are not as many female bartenders. Well, here's a fun fact for all the ladies on the call today. You are biologically and evolutionarily more advanced than men. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'll say it one more time in case you didn't hear the first one. If anybody wants to put me off mute or out of your uh, earbuds so your significant other can hear me behind. Guys, uh, women are biologically and evolutionarily more advanced than men. We've got science to back it. So let's talk about it. Ladies, when you were born, you were born with more receptors on your tongue for the flavor of bitterness than men were. This is an evolutionary advantage. And this is across the board. This is not on a bell curve. Women by far and large, more bitter receptors on our tongue. And the reasoning is this, James, when we were back in the hunter gatherer mode and men were hunting and women were gathering, when we were out in the fields, we had to learn very quickly what things in nature were considered poisonous. Well, guess what things in nature are poisonous? They have a bitter flavor. So women's bodies actually evolved quicker. So we would eliminate bitterness from our diets as well as our community diets. So we wouldn't end up poisoning ourselves. But guys, this does not serve women in the bartending world. Of course, if you know, and you look back at all of the ways that mixology came to be in the late 1860s, it was men serving cocktails for other men because women weren't legally allowed in the bars. And that means cocktails were made for men by men's palettes for other men with men's palettes. And most of these classic cocktails are considered too bitter. So when I was diving into a lot of Italian cocktails, they use lovely bitter things like Campari and Aperol. They use vermouths. They use other spirits like Fernet. But when overused, these can be too bitter for a woman's palate. And most of these classic cocktails overuse them. So I wanted to do something that kind of gave back the dignity, the respect that bitterness deserves, but also from a woman's perspective. So the first thing I did is I wanted to make sure that I had a cute little garnish. And this is something, it's a little woodland creature that I just clipped onto the side of my drink. I buy these um, in bulk on Amazon. And you can see he's carrying a little edible flower, which is lovely. It's got a great smell to it. He's carrying his little bouquet. It's great for COVID um, safe reasons as well, because of course it's just for aromatic reasons. It's not being overly touched behind the bar. And it also gives this sort of like a little tail on the end. Now, the first thing I do with this particular cocktails, I wanted to make it with something that was unexpected. And that's going to be 
margarita mix. Usually when you think margarita mix, and if you're grabbing this at the store, you just think you got to make a margarita from it. But guess what? This stuff has got some lovely complexity in it with the orange flavor in here. We've got these agave notes, which is lovely, a little bit more on the earthy side rather than just a straight sweetness from cane sugar. And we've also got lime juice. Remember guys that lime juice still has more bitterness or a chemical called limonene in it than lemons do. So they add a particular bitter edge to cocktails, whereas lemon juice adds more sour notes and less bitterness. So the first thing I did when I made this cocktail is we're going to shake this cocktail. Unlike the first cocktail, we are adding more sugar into this cocktail and we need to shake it. And scientifically guys, the reason why we shake cocktails, especially if they have sugar is because the small receptors on your tongue that pick up the flavor of sweet cannot detect sweetness when a product is too cold. So the more sugar something has in it, the colder the product needs to be because otherwise as it warms up, it tastes sweeter or too sweet for the palate. So let's begin. I'm going to first go ahead and put this inside of the chat box. If anybody wants to fall along right with me as we go, we are first going to go out and add two full ounces of vodka. That's right. We're not using tequila in this one. Let's let all of those other things shine while I'm adding this two full ounces of vodka. And by the way, after this class, please don't speak to in-laws. Okay. You know what I'm saying? You guys are drinking a lot. So we'll avoid any of them. What we're going to do is make it rain right on in. Now, remember vodka is great. It's a much more neutral spirit rather than our mezcal or even our next one, which is going to be a reposado tequila. We give this a smell. Once you smell this, we really want to build that flavor base. Okay. We're looking for something that's got punch. We want bitterness. We want that je ne sais quoi. We want that complexity under the surface. That's where this papa comes right into play. You are going to put putting in three full ounces of margarita mix. It seems like a lot, but believe me, we want the sweetness on this to come through because when we add the Campari in the end, we need the sweetness and the acidity to balance out all of that bitterness. Three full ounces goes into the glass. And then if anyone's following along, you can do what I consider a Napa Valley swirl. That's right. Give me a little Napa Valley swirl. Give me a smell. You can smell all that agave. It comes through really clearly on this particular mixer. You can smell that lime. And now we want to go ahead and shake it with ice. Now, remember, I told you guys earlier that James Bond wanted something that was shaken and not stirred. And the fun part, and if you really learn all the science behind this, is shaken drinks tend to be weaker drinks. That's because when you shake a cocktail, you're incorporating more dilution and you're making the drink colder. So when James Bond was ordering a martini, He's shaken and not stirred, he was actually getting a less strong drink and he was getting something a little on the waterier side, which is fine with me. He had a job to do, y'all. Let's go ahead and give this a shake. And remember, when you're shaking, always picture your shake face. That's right. You don't want a constipated or angry shake face. So just make sure you look cute while doing it. 12 seconds on the clock. It's always what I do when I'm doing my shake. I make sure I go back and forth. And then sometimes I put in an up and down if I didn't decide to do any gym work today. Just making sure that you get that full rotation of the biceps. I know y'all haven't been to the gym in a while. Don't lie to mama. Once we've got this in, this is when we want to take this drink and we want to put it inside of our cocktail. Now, this first makes it, you gotta grab it all open. And when we grab this open, I'm so strong. We are going to strain it in. When I strain this in, you're going to note the difference. Note how there's no aeration in this, no bubbles. That was from the first cocktail. And note that when we pour this in and we're going to channel our inner Tom Cruise. So we're going to go, Caitlin, from low to high, low to high. This is like making us look like we're Tom Cruise from that classic, iconic 1980s movie cocktail. You're going to notice as we get this in the beautiful froth that sits on the top of this glass. Now let's make this buddy shine. Much like an Aperol spritz or any of these classic Italian cocktails, they have something called bitterness. Now, remember, the Italians are famous for bitterness. So we are going to add in Campari. Campari is a beautiful liqueur that is bright red in color and has a lot of bittering agents, a lot of spice notes underneath here. And of course, it's got a little alcohol too. Alcohol is going to add a lovely trigeminal effect. But the first thing we want to do is put our cocktail on a nice flat surface. You're then going to take your Campari and you're going to grab a spoon. I'm going to grab a long spoon for this particular purpose. And we are just going to pour a little bit of this Campari 
right on the spoon and then drizzle it over as such. Now you could make a little sort of swirly pattern in all of this beautiful guy here. So you get a nice little pink swirl, um, but you'll also notice as we get down that anything with any type of sugar sort of sinks to the bottom. So now we're getting this beautiful ombre where we're getting more of this like pink on the bottom going into this sort of yellowy note on top. And of course, when you smell this, You'll give it a smell and the first thing you pick up is of course any of the Campari that's sitting on top of the foam. Remember this would be considered a bitters float because it's floating on the foam and it's really making something lovely. Then you're going to go ahead and give this a taste always and you want to ask yourself some questions. First thing I do when I'm making cocktails is I always like to customize. And this is something that you'll have to figure out for your own palate. But I always ask myself, is this sweet enough for me first? Because remember, everybody tastes sweetness differently. So what I think might be perfect, Lee might think isn't sweet enough. Jessica think might, might think it's too sweet. And then of course, there are some people who think it's just right, right? It's sort of the Goldilocks effect. But once you've decided that it is sweet enough, then Carrie, what you're going to do is you're going to ask if it's too sweet for you. If it's too sweet for you, then you're going to go ahead and that's right. You're going to grab for more Campari. You're going to go ahead and put an extra little dash on this on top. Now, remember Carrie, we've already got like a bunch of vodka in here. So you don't want to put too, too much, honey. We're not looking to recreate spring break 1998 up in here, but what we want to do is put enough in here. So we are getting a lot of that bitter undertow in the flavor. You can see already how this splits in the glass. So we've got this lovely color here. It splits because the sugar is more dense than any of the other ingredients. If you want it to be a little bit better incorporated, you'll just stick your spoon in. You'll give it a little stir from underneath and you can see automatically it's all one color like magic. I am really hoping that's just a straight glass of vodka, Rebecca. I'm hoping that's what you got in there, girl. Mm. Mm. Now remember, this is not a useless garnish. Whenever people are looking at garnishes, especially post COVID, I think it's really important that we look at things like edible flowers, things that add aroma. Because remember, our strongest sense as human beings is our sense of smell. And it's really important that we can smell different things. If you've got fresh herbs tipped onto the side of the glass, if you've got something like lavender, it's gonna be the first thing that you pick up. And even if there isn't lavender underneath the surface or inside of your cocktail, your brain will think there is because this is your strongest sense. Also guys, fun fact, um, I'm just gonna point out, Nizreen, did you know that your sense of smell and your hippocampus or your memory memory center are inextricably interlinked. So did anybody here ruin any alcohol for themselves in college? I don't know, maybe a little too much Southern comfort one night, maybe a little too much rum. John, he was smiling at the rum. I saw that baby. Here's the thing, John, when you ruin a, uh, alcohol for yourself in college, right? Like maybe you went too crazy with the, I don't know, jungle juice that y'all made in your fraternity. And then you ended up in the hurt box for about three days afterwards. Then you will remember that anytime you smell ever clear, it's like a time machine, baby. It takes you right back to the day that you mess with it. Okay. And then that's what we need to retrain ourselves as adults. This sense of smell is inextricable from that hippocampus, but you can retrain it. So not saying that you want to break out the jungle juice and make something that you made in college, but if you were afraid of a particular liquor because you ruined it for yourself, now is the time as an adult to try it 10 more times. And yes, it's not going to be in like a shop format. You're not liquor losing it like you did in college, but you will be retraining yourself with good memories in small amounts. This is the way as an adult, you can retrain your nose from something that you abused in the past and then just couldn't stand the smell of. Southern Comfort and I, we're still working on it, baby doll, because that stuff really messed me up. Now guys, the last one I wanna talk about is something interesting. But before I go ahead, does anybody have any questions? I'm sharing a lot of science over here. So if there's anything that's not clear to you, anything that you're dying to know about these two cocktails or something that didn't seem clear science wise. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Anything you're dying to know? You can ask me about your TRPM51 receptors. I'm a neurogastronomical expert. Let's get this going y'all. Okay. Fabulous. Here's a couple of more things I want to share. Mm. I think it's interesting because a lot of people, especially people in the bar world, they're a little bit reticent when they see mixers come in bottles, but I love them. And here's why. Um, when I started working with these, I love the fact that there's really concentrated flavor. Listen, I agree. There's some people would say, oh, why would you get real lemon when you could squeeze an actual real lemon? 
But the fact is that there's no such thing as a bad mixer. It's only what the mixer is supposed to be used for. And what I really love is I love that a lot of these mixers have a great concentrated flavor. This means guys that you can use these particular mixers as a jumping off point or what I call gateways into more challenging liquors. Think of it this way. Most people usually know what vodka tastes like. It's their go-to. They're not afraid of it. But when it comes to selling things or even getting people to try mezcal and yay, Reposado tequilas, when it has when it's funky rums or anything in the liqueur world that's got bitterness to it, these are more challenging. And frankly, people are afraid of them. Most classes that I do, because I teach classes all the time, I get a lot of people who are reticent to try whiskey. Maybe they've only had tequila and vodka. And so I'm always trying to find new ways to introduce these funkier spirits in a much more friendly gateway way. Well, Lemons, real lemons aren't going to cut it because they're too nuanced. They're not flavorful enough. They don't bring what you need to stand up to these funky things. I always picture it like this. When you've got limes versus lemons, there's a reason why in the mixology world, we partner limes a lot more with funkier spirits like tequilas and rums. It's because limes are more pungent. They have more limonene inside of their peels, which means they've got a higher concentration of that lovely lime flavor, but they're also more bitter with their pith and they've got a stronger flavor with their uh, pulp, which is on the inside, what we squeeze the juice from. These things, you take it even to the next level. The concentrated levels in a lot of these, especially for this next cocktail, it really just knocks a lot of these lovely, heavier spirits out of the world, creating something that's much more balanced and much more unique. And that's why I like to say, if you've got something that you want to try and it's your first time trying it, like an Añejo tequila or a Mezcal, instead of sipping on it on its own, try a cocktail with a bottled mixer, because what I think you'll find is that you'll, th you'll actually be able to taste that particular thing better. It will blend better. And then of course it will open up the gateway for you to want to try other funkier, weirder, random things. And isn't that the goal? We all want to try everything all the time. Get yourself out of your comfort zone with some Julia childlike conviction. Now this next cocktail, I joked, uh, of course, with Jen when I called her yesterday, because I had to teach a class. I said, Jen, if I'm drunk on this class, girl, it's because you sent me these mixers and I just keep making this one cocktail. And I'll tell you, I did not tell my parents exactly what was in it, but my parents were having a really good day yesterday. Guys, this one is really refreshing. And what I love about this one is that this takes sort of the simplicity of summer and takes it to a new level. This is going to be a lemonade drink. And I love lemonade drinks drinks because unlike the first cocktail that's umami and a little on the spicy side or the second cocktail which is much more delicate and nuanced but has that undertow of bitterness there's no denying that lemonade is the drink of the summer every summer and the cool part about this is that you could even remove the alcohol and it tastes fantastic so if you're looking for something no proof and you don't want to squeeze a bunch of lemons like by hand which just nobody wants to do ever this honestly is incredible here's how you're going to do it. I'm going to go ahead and put this all inside of the chat box so you can see everything that's in here that I'm going on. I'm going to go ahead and format it as well real quick so it doesn't look like a jumble. And then we are going to go ahead and get started. First thing you want to do when you're making this cocktail, guys, is you're just going to grab um, a shaker that is nice and clean. I'm going to be using a ball jar. I feel like there's nothing more summery than like making lemonade in a ball jar. So I'm going to pop it on open. And then I I want to remind you, this one takes you out of your comfort zone. So grab those dusty bottles of Añejo and Reposado tequilas that you've not been sipping on lately. The one that, I don't know, your brother's girlfriend's ex-wife's um, partner brought over to your housewarming party 10 years ago. And let's go ahead and dust it off and let's get one 1.5 ounces of Reposado and tequila. Give it a smell when you've got it in here. You're going to notice guys that Reposado tequila, it's not quite like Mezcal. It's been aged. So it's got more of an oaky note to it. So instead of being as more smoky note, like a Mezcal would be the pinas inside of a tequila, any type of um, uh, pina, which is in the agave has not been roasted. It's simply been steamed. So there's not going to be sort of that lovely undertow of caramelization, like in a Mezcal it's going to be more on the oaky side. So once you give this a smell, go ahead, pour it on in 
And then we want to build the base. The base is going to first include a bunch of real lemon. Now you can kind of go how you like to do this. So I'm a person who prefers a more tart lemonade. I don't know, Jessica, if you're the type of person who likes a more sweet lemonade or a more tart lemonade, but with real lemon, the beauty of it is it's super concentrated. So when you guys get this stuff out, you're going to be adding in 0.5 ounces if you like it more on the sweet side and one full ounce of real lemon. This stuff is going to be astringent. So let's just explain what that is as we get it into our drink. Acidity versus astringency is an interesting scientific thing. When we think of acidity, we might go and think of warheads or sour patch kids. When you put those things inside of your mouth, your mouth puckers and then your mouth waters. And when your mouth waters, it's a mark of acidity. That's because acid is very damaging to the soft tissue inside of your mouth. So what your body has to do is elicit a saliva gland response to rush in the saliva, break down all those acids so it doesn't burn the inside of your mouth. Now, this is fantastic, but what I like about real lemon is it's got astringency in it as well. This particular real lemon has got a drying sensation in the mouth. I don't want to call anybody out about their personal lives, but Shelby, have you ever gone a little too crazy with a bottle of red wine, honey? You know what I'm saying? Maybe you like promised yourself only one glass of Pinot and next thing you know, like half the bottle was gone. You were like, wait a minute here. I did not expect that. Guys, whenever this happens to you, you might notice that when you drink a lot of wine, you get a dehydrated feeling in your mouth. It's like that cotton mouth feel, right? You just sort of feel like you need some water. That is the polar opposite of acidity. It's called astringency. And what's lovely about this lemonade is it really gives you sort of this drying sensation in the mouth. So it keeps you coming back for more. So it's just like your thirst is always wanting it. It's just so refreshing. So we're going to go ahead. We've got this one full ounce for me, but you can go to 0.5. I give a little Napa Valley swirl, and then I'm going to give it a smell. You can smell that drying note of the real lemon in here. The concentration is great. It really stacks up to the tequila. So let's go ahead and grab out our secret weapon our sweet and sour mix. Because here's the thing, we don't always want to feel that dehydrated note really, really acutely. So Jillian, when you think of lemonade, you're thinking of something that's gotta be refreshing, right? It's got that lovely sugar balance in it. This is where your sweet and sour mix comes in. In addition to, of course, having a little bit more tartness than the real lemon does, so it really gives a punch of acidity, this is where our sugar is coming in. And it's not too much. It's still concentrated enough, this lemon flavor, to give you some sort of vibes. It's really got that summery note, but we are going to put it a lot. We're putting in two full ounces. First, give this a smell. And if you've got your real lemon next to you, you can also give a little smell to your real lemon and a smell to the sweet and sour and see how one is more astringent and one is more acidic. And you can pick this up with your nose. Now I'm putting in two full ounces. So you can see it in here and you're going to go ahead and make it rain. Just make it rain on in there. And then of course, we're going to shake this one. Remember, we want to shake drinks when we want to make them more aerated. And remember two ounces of mixer is quite a lot for the sugar content. And because that's a lot for sugar content, we need to make this drink colder because of course, Jen, when you make a drink colder, it's going to be harder for your mouth to pick up the sugar. And that's going to be great for a lemonade based drink when we're trying to balance the sweetness and the sugar together. Remember, once you've got this in, put your cap on nice and tight. And I always tell people this ain't QVC, okay? We ain't no shake weight infomercial. All right, y'all. I don't want to see anybody like shaking like this ever. This is not a South Park episode. We are going to shake like we are Vanna White, the famous Vanna White from Wheel of Fortune, by making sure you put your dominant hand to the top. We want, of course, two non dominant fingers right on the bottom like this. Anchor your thumb to the side, bring the entire thing to the side. And it looks like you're selling somebody an E, right? There you go. A little van of white arms. And then go ahead, shake it back and forth toward your face. Go up and down. And for 12 seconds, make sure you've got the cutest shake face. I like to say, keep it loose, but keep it tight, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Just make sure you got that shake face. Get everything whipped, get it aerated, get it chilled, and most importantly, get it diluted. Because remember, we want all of these flavors to combine. And that's where this water really comes in. Do you guys see this beautiful aeration, these bubbles on the top? That's what you're looking for. Don't stop until you get a nice head of bubbles. It's sort of like pouring a beer. Take your top off like this. 
And this is when we're gonna build the drink. And this is when I have to walk away to make sure I get my ice cubes. Now I created these ice cubes, they're a little bit special, but I had to keep them in the freezer until I actually put them in the glass for a reason. Because what I love about edible flowers is that they are way more versatile than just clipping them onto the side of the glass. You can also freeze edible flowers into your ice cubes. And I really love this idea, guys, because when you're making any type of edible ice or anything at all, you can note that these have got little flowers tucked right in the top of the cube. So they're really special. I'm gonna go ahead and put one large ice cube on the bottom so I can go ahead and stick them on. And then I'm going to put this gorgeous little one right on top of my thing so you can see it's kind of sticking out. And now I want to pour this in. So I'm going to show you guys again, you want to channel your inner Coyote Ugly. That's right. Pretending like you're about to buck for a nice roll in Coyote Ugly too. If anybody knows, that's a really great bar movie from the 90s. And we're going to pour this from low to high. Give me a little flare. So you're going to go low to high, low to high, make it rain. Remember, I want to see not just, of course, aeration in your glass, but I want to see it in your cocktail glass as well. So it's not just here, it's here. Now, the beautiful part about this, guys, is that when you bring it down, you can see the purple flowers contrasting with the yellow right on top. So we've got everything sort of built in. These are really lovely. When they melt in, remember, these are edible flowers. So these are not going to, of course, be toxic to any of your cocktails. Make sure you do get edible flowers not everything in your garden is edible but if you don't have edible flowers you can wait until your herbs start to blossom um, your herbs almost every single one of them will flower if you're losing those for cookings pick the flowers off because it gives a lot less taste to the leaves but if you've got this now i'm not going to use a straw for this particular cocktail i know straws can be popular i don't have any biodegradable ones that have come in yet that i've liked so go ahead and give it a smell and the first thing guys that I can smell is I can smell that lovely Oki and Yeho. I can smell that like tequila, it's just coming through, but really you can also smell a balance of that tart acidity on the top, a little bit of that real lemon and astringency. And when you get this a sip, it's like it's not 50 degrees in Chicago right now and raining. You know what I'm saying? Like this feels like I just went on a bike ride through Napa Valley in the 70s and I'm not being stuck in this horrifying weather that Chicago has been dealing up. But Here's the thing, whenever you try this cocktail, it's up to you at this point to customize. So let's just say, Rebecca, you taste this cocktail later and you're like, ooh, I went too crazy with the real lemon, right? Maybe it's a little bit too on the acidic side for you. It's just got a little bit more of that pinch in your mouth and you want something more mellow. That's when you turn right back, of course, to your sweet and sour mix. You can add this, but add it in small amounts. Remember, John, we are not Bon Jovi, okay? We're not gonna like dump this willy-nilly in our cocktail and we're living on a prayer that we get it right. We're scientists here. We're gonna put one teaspoon at a time. We're just gonna put a little bit on and then we're going to make sure we give this a little tossle of our ice. So just go ahead and give it a little tossle right here and then give it a smell and a taste again to make sure that you get a good balance of the sweet, and the sour. Is anybody got any questions? I know these, I, I will tell you this. So Nazreen, you can make these with anything. Um, I just went and picked mine out of the garden literally right today. I just think that these are so stunning. They're easy to make. Um, remember you can get silicone molds for any of these and they just freeze really, really well. And then of course you can have them of all colors, all shapes, all sizes. If you make them, um, jelly, yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay, excellent. Um, for any bartenders that are garnishing drinks with orange and lemon wedge, and also I should tell you one more note on this. Um, before I get to the that question, Jillian, the thing I want you guys to remember is that you do have grenadine. Now, um, I was never a fan of grenadine growing up, and I, I think it's because I didn't like the way it was being used in um, Shirley temples, because remember, that was the first time most of us ever had a grenadine was in a Shirley temple, a Sprite plus grenadine. But as I became an adult, I realized that it was just being used in the wrong way. Guys, Guys, grenadine is really special. Um, it has got a lovely bitter undertone and it tastes almost medicinal. You shouldn't be scared of this. Remember that anytime that you smell something, especially if it's in a bottle right on your nose, you're getting the most concentrated flavor that you can possibly get. Don't trust your nose on that. You're going to want to make sure that you incorporate this properly into your cocktail. If you wanted to give this a little extra pizzazz, I would take 
just about a teaspoon to two teaspoons of grenadine. And you're going to see how this falls right to the bottom, like a magic trick. This is where, of course, guys, any type of tequila sunrise comes in. You can see the grenadine falls right to the bottom. You get a nice sort of uh, layer of the grenadine that's folding up. Um, I'm a big fan, especially if I'm making a uh, pink lemonade like this, um, to just give it a little bit of a stir. Just get everything nice and combined right inside there. So you can see like a magic trick, we've got everything pink now and you can change it. Ah, there you go. He just flipped on his own. I love that. You can see your little guy here flipping around to give you that still sort of different contrast with the purple and the pink. Oh my gosh. New trend on for summer. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, cognac and Armagnac, Bob, mark my words. Um, cognac and Armagnac are coming back guys. All the kids are raging about the nineties. And, um, there was a very popular song from the nineties. I'm sure you all remember it was called pass the Cavarcier. Um, guys, cognac and Armagnac have been overdue for a comeback. Um, they are strong flavors, which would go perfectly with these. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to try this lemonade with cognac in it, giving it more of those sort of rich notes or some of that grape undertone, it would be absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to really place my bets on Carmen, uh, cognac and Armagnac this year. Um, also guys, a lot of people are going for more exotic spirits because remember they have not been traveling for a long time. So as much as it's been nice to like, be able to go and pick up a bottle down at your local distillery, that's been happening for 365 days plus. So now people are wanting to get something that's a little more exotic, your funky rums, your Pisco's, um, anything that's reminding them of travel. Maybe they're missing their South African brandies. Maybe they're missing something that's going to be a little bit more wild or any of these lovely liqueurs that are coming out that have got more original flavors like saffron. Um, I can see those being really trendy in cocktails this year. All right. Bartender's garnishing drink with orange and lemon. So here's the thing. While I love garnishing things, guys, I think that really it's got a lot of people are turning away from cut fruit. Um, if you remember back at the bar, you usually would find a little tray that had a cover on it. It usually had pre-cut lemons, pre-cut oranges and pre-cut limes and maybe olives. Or sometimes if you were at a really fancy place, cocktail onions, but you would also notice sometimes that the bartender, they joke that that's lunch, dinner, and breakfast. That's right. If they're using a long shift, sometimes they would pop their fingers and eat some of the olives out of there, or maybe steal the garnishes. That is not, of course, something that a lot of people are doing. And I just had a recent bar consult where we were talking about not cutting fresh fruit. So here's the thing. You're going to rely on things that have got already built in acidity from lemons and limes. And this is why I think the big challenge here is learning chemically how we are going to put together things that have got already built in lemon juice and lime juice and concentrate versus something that's going to be fresh. The thing is, is that when you're using using anything from concentrate, especially in these bottles, the beauty is they go a longer way. We can dilute them better. We can actually uh, chemically be able to track exactly what we're putting in. Not every lemon and lime is going to give you the same amount of acidity. I think we've all had those duds that we get from the grocery store where we pick up a lemon, we cut it open and oh no, it's mealy. There's not enough juice in it. It's a little bit on the dry side. Maybe it just tastes kind of funky. I know that I've recently bought a bunch of limes from my corner store and was so disappointed to find that when you squeeze them, no juice comes out. I was like, what is going on here? And that's why yesterday when I was making this lemonade for my parents, I was like, gosh, how much easier it is. It is that I already know exactly with consistency, how this is going to turn out every single time having that acidic undertow. And then remember balancing everything with a bit of astringency and a little bit of spark. This stuff is fantastic. Fantastic. Whether you're making something that's going to be with a large punch of lemon, like the lemonade, or if you want to just add something like a float, remember that this has less sugar content. The less sugar content something has, the more it will float to the top. So guys, that's really interesting to give you more aromatics of fruitiness to the top of a drink without having to, of course, use a garnish of lemon or lime that you're cutting and handling. So that is two things that I would think. Any other questions that you're dying to know before I drop even more science on you? and drink these drinks. Guys, I'm, I'm drinking alone here. Someone's got it. Is this the body shots portion of the class? Come on, Tim. I see you. There we go, Tim. That's what I want to see. Mm -hmm. Guys, the cool part about mixology is there's so much interesting science. 
And remember, when you're delving into doing these things and you're looking at different flavor combinations, start reaching for things that are more concentrated. But if you're a little bit on the afraid side, reach for cocktails like the number two. The cool thing is that you guys could probably find a bunch of different liqueurs, but even though even then you've got other things like the sweetened lime juice, which I didn't make in a cocktail today. Remember that this can really make a great no proof cocktail. So let's say that we're going to make this lemonade, right? Or we're going to make this second cocktail. That sweetened lime juice has got a lot of different flavors in there and an undertow of bitterness. So if you didn't want to use Campari, for example, remember that the sweetened lime juice, while it does have sweetened in the name, has a lot of bitter undertow to it. So even if you're making a no proof cocktail and you'll hear me say no proof because I do not use mocktail or virgin. There's nothing sexy, Jody, about a 34 plus year old woman going into a bar and saying, um, can I get that a mocktail please? Like there's nothing cute. So I call it a no proof cocktail because it gives it a little bit more dignity, a little more sexiness back to that particular one. But I do make a lot of no proof cocktails and I'm always looking for different things like roses, grenadine, or the sweetened lime juice that have a built-in bitterness to it, but no alcohol to boot because those things are hard to come by. Try and find some mixers that do not have alcohol that have a lovely bitter undertow to give you more depth and complexity to a cocktail. And I will tell you this, this one is probably my favorite. It really just just have a nice punch to it. It's got that lovely undertow. So it's one of my faves. Anything else you're dying to know? So I'm, I'm going to double. It's one way for my left hand, one for my right hand over here. Here we go. Now the party start. All right. Hmm. Guys, there's so many great products. I will say that one, another thing I didn't use today um, that I actually uh, make sure a lot of folks are is that I feel like uh, simple syrup is something that goes into most cocktails. I don't add a lot of simple syrup. As a matter of fact, right inside of the chat, you'll see that most cocktails that I make usually have about two teaspoons of simple syrup. Um, I love Rosa Simple Syrup. Um, it's available pretty much everywhere. So whenever I have clients who are buying mixology kits from me or wanting to uh, have the ingredients shipped to them, it's really nice, especially Actually, a lot of my clients are choosing Instacart these days um, for the easy and convenience of it. And Rose's simple syrup is something that is great. It keeps for a much longer time than a regular simple syrup. It's a fantastic flavor and it just gives that little extra bump of sugar. Remember, sugar should be incorporated in all cocktails because remember, if you are taking a cocktail and diluting it, bringing down the temperature, it's going to be harder for you to pick up on that flavor. So the roses simple syrup is great. It just pushes that extra bump of flavor and it gives us something in chemistry called viscosity and taking you back, Carrie, to that seventh grade viscosity word that you probably have forgotten. That means thickness in a cocktail. You'll notice that all of these cocktails have some level of sugar because we don't want a watery cocktail. So we need to add a little bit more density to it. And that's happened through sugar. That's the viscosity. Yes. Fantastic. And I just saw Jillian put up more information that you can get, of course, inside of the chat there, if anybody needs any more information on any of these mixers. Um, and if there's anybody who's got any questions, here's the thing. I know that my email will, can be tossed around, but you can also drop into my DMS, like all the creepy boys do. If you've got other mixology questions for practical application and Instagram, you can drop in for at hollow leg mixology. I work with a lot of ENTs from Northwestern university. I'm based in Chicago. And so I get uh, a lot of questions. I do a lot of talks about neurogastronomical science as it pertains to trigeminal effects, which of course, remember are those chemical sensations that our nerves pick up. And I also talk a lot about different things like um, sweet, sour, salty, bitterness. I talk about the olfactory bulb a lot. So if you, or maybe your partner makes a cocktail that is horrifying. So John, let's just say like a couple nights from now, you make an awful cocktail and you're like, oh my gosh, SOS Devin, what do I do? You can just drop into my DMs, send me a little bit of like what you made. So a little bit of the background of it. And then usually like your cocktail Sherpa getting you to the top of cocktail mountain, I will use science to figure out where you went wrong and we'll fix it for you because guys, there's no such thing as a mistake in mixology. And there's no such thing that science can't fix. Um, really it's all built in. We always figure out how we can balance one thing to another, how we can really put fire out if you add too much heat and the, the limits are 
endless when it comes to mixology. So it's so much fun to work with different things. And just remember, this is the time. This is your day. This is the time to reach for those funky things. So go get that weird bottle of rum. Go get that lovely bottle of Añejo or that Mezcal that's been just sitting and collecting dust and try it in a cocktail with these beautiful mixers. Cause then you're going to see that it's going to open the floodgates for you to want to try everything weird in your world. <laughs> Jody, yeah, we're going to get you making so it. Much. Yeah, of course, Jill. And it's my pleasure. This was wonderful and so informative. And I mistakenly did not come with my bar here with me. So I've just been drooling alongside you. So I'm going to need to go get my Mr. and Mrs. T's mixers and some tequila and make one of these drinks happen. Um, if anyone wants any information on these products, again, that chat is in the link. Um, but Devin took us very quickly to our hour here. So that is pretty much all we have for you. And we'll let you guys get to your evenings of cocktail mixing. Um, but thank you so much for your energy. This was a wonderful way to wrap up our evenings.